And welcome to the Oddity Archive, the show that brings back all those childhood memories that you never knew you had. Remember back on the first sign-offs episode when we briefly touched on some post-sign-off teletext programming? Before I was so rudely cut off by our producer. Well, after a slight shake-up at Oddity Archive headquarters, now we can crack this little egg wide open and properly discuss the long-forgotten art of teletext television. It's history lesson time again. In the analog days of television, there was a certain unused portion of the video signal, known as the vertical blanking interval. These came in the form of little gaps that would last such a short time, literally thousands of a second, that nobody would ever detect them. Now, as far back as the late 60s, some electronics engineers were already mulling over just what, if anything, could be achieved in those gaps. Over time we found some uses for them. They included closed captioning, and the ever-loved Macrovision copy protection software used on a lot of VHS and DVD titles, which essentially operated on the same principle as the early pay TV scrambler boxes, introduce a rogue frequency, or pulses in this case, to your target, and kiss your picture goodbye. But I digress. In 1972, over in England, some computer engineers came up with an idea for use of these signal gaps, and came up with an early interactive television service called CFAX, which was projected to cost about 70 pounds, call it $100, per customer. You'd have a little dedicated remote control hooked to your TV, and on this remote you'd punch in a three-digit code, and an on-screen page of news, weather, sports scores, etc. would appear. This service didn't quite happen. But in 1974, the BBC opted to pick up a non-interactive edition of the CFAX service to air over the air in the overnight post-sign-off hours, offering a continuous loop of news, weather, sports, and miscellanea. CFAX lasted all the way up to October of 2012. This brings us back around to the States and the American equivalent to CFAX, KeyFAX. KeyFAX was home to America's first computer-generated TV program, the teletext news magazine Night Owl. Not to be confused with Night Towel. I own the copyrights to that. Airing on Chicago's WFLD for roughly a year, starting in September of 1981, Night Owl was like a more elaborate cable TV community calendar. Just with news. Shortly thereafter, cable superstation WTBS, or simply TBS, started running Keyfax News in the overnight hours. This lasted a bit longer than Night Owl, running from 1981 to 1984. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to find any footage, so in one of our classic archive ironic twists, we're forced to use footage exclusively from the local edition of Keyfax. Night Owl has a certain charm to it, the news items are simple and to the point, the little attempts at pictures are, by early 80s CG standards, pretty decent, and for a music geek like myself, the music choices are generally enjoyable and surprisingly eclectic. <laughs> If you'll indulge me for a little while here, I'd like to discuss what became of key facts. In April of 1982, about halfway through Night Owl's run, the Keycom Electronic Publishing Corporation was formed. The idea was to launch an interactive television service similar to the one CFAX over in England had envisioned a decade earlier, and indeed was finally getting ready to launch in the UK. In November of 1982, Keyfax attempted the old 1972 British-style remote control-based service. It ran $20 a month, $10 for the service, and $10 for the necessary decoder box. Yes, we at the Archive have unearthed yet another decoder box. Imagine that. Anyway, there was one little problem. CFAX owned the technology, and Keyfax didn't have all the needed licenses. This caused the service to be unusable for about another year until all the licensing issues were worked out. After everything was cleared up, this edition of Keyfax peaked at about 30,000 subscribers. This was in early 1984. This edition of the service was discontinued shortly thereafter. 
but by this point Key Fax, unfazed, had something even bigger in mind. Now the vision that Keyfax had was to introduce a service in which you could not only access news and stuff, but also download games or shop online. Pretty exciting stuff for 1984, not that we had many options quite yet. Unfortunately this was effectively a forerunner to another interactive TV failure, Web TV. So? What do you think? <laughs> I'll take it! Don't wait, call now for a free- Anyway, for $60 you'd get either a software package for your home computer, like your Commodore 64, or you could have another adapter box. Either way, this system allowed for what would today be equivalent to the data plan on a cell phone. A very pricey data plan. You'd be allowed either 5 hours use per month for $15, or 15 hours use for $30. Like all seemingly half-assed TV-related ideas in the first half of the 1980s, this edition of Keyfax launched in… where all these technologies went to die back then. It went to… all together now… Chicago. I swear I have this mental image of some poor Chicagoan guy with all these useless gadgets who's on the brink of bankruptcy because of it. But I digress. Again. Launched in November of 1984, Keyfax was a miserable failure, with a subscriber base by some estimates as low as 300 customers. Keyfax kept trying to make inroads towards any market that might have it, especially businesses, but to no avail. Keyfax died in early 1986. Or they could have just kept making Night Owl. Probably would have been a better business model. We'll be right back. Keyfax presents The Shopping Trip. Keyfax lets you turn information into action. Keyfax gives you shopping, banking, tickets, reservations, stock quotes, and much more. Get into action, Chicago. Call 1-800-4-KEYFAX for a free demonstration at a store near you. Chances are that if you have cable, you still have a community billboard channel or maybe some sort of newswire service, and you probably don't pay any attention to it. Which is why I'm talking about it, of course. These billboards have been around about as long as cable itself, but back in the 70s and 80s they were used more as overnight filler. Now call me pretentious, what, no soundbite? I have a soft spot for these things. Sure, today's boards are a little more pleasing to look at than the old Teletext-styled block graphics, but I still prefer the old-style graphics to the prettier new ones. This first clip here is, as of this episode, the oldest known surviving home recording of one of these billboards, dating to late November of 1977, from Puget Sound, Washington's ever imaginatively named service, Cable TV Puget Sound. This would also have to be one of the earliest uses of a teletext news service in the U.S. The NOAA weather radio playing in the background is a nice touch as well. This clip is from a Reuters news feed airing on Manhattan Cable in New York, which dates to what I believe to be late December of 1977. With regards to the radio station playing in the background, I don't understand a word of Greek, but if I did, I'd imagine I'd have a tough time following the Greek radio broadcast from New York's WEVD-FM 97.9, while also trying to read the English news feed. It also makes me wonder, were the only people with cable in Manhattan in 1977 Greek immigrants? Where's my time machine? Now, this next clip is my personal favorite. This is from Jericho, New York, dating to October of 1978. I love the fact that this seemed to be geared towards children, in fact it's probably the only overnight programming for kids in existence that I know of. You have the viewer submitted jokes, complete with the kids addresses, and you have games, and of course, the school lunch menu, and yet another local radio station playing in the background to boot. 
in this case in all Beatles format. Well, I guess I'd call that a step in the right direction. This clip gets even better than that. This particular clip aired immediately after a showing of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I'm just a sweet transvestite. Did I mention that this channel, when on the air, called itself a family movie channel? This is Cablevision's Family Channel 10. Your address for premier entertainment, motion pictures from Hollywood's heyday, and... I love it when I don't have to write any jokes. By the time the late 80s rolled around, the electronic program guide channels were a staple of cable TV. First up, we've got this one from Naperville, Illinois, from October of 1987. I like that somebody deems the home shopping channel to be worthy of a highlight. The song playing in the background also seems weirdly appropriate. From only about 15 minutes later, we see that the guide has shifted gears from being just a straight list of channels and now includes show descriptions and ads. As you can see, these channels also provide definitive proof that computer techs are completely lost without spell check. There's supposed to be two O's in two. Jeez. This clip from West Covina, California from December of 1989 shows the on-duty tech revising the outdated programming info from a day or two earlier at 11 o'clock in the morning. Live. Over the air. At least this guy understands that the Rolling Stones are indeed terrifying. This particular screen sticks for literally about five minutes. Perhaps this guy was having some artistic issue with this ad, or he just really digs Dolly Parton and stopped to listen. Can't say I'd be any different. Around this time, the larger cable companies had developed the best remembered of the electronic program guides, namely the Preview Guide. This channel was created with the help of the Commodore Amiga. I'll let you decide if that's a good or a bad thing. Anyway, sometimes it felt like the preview guide was the perfect storm of technical glitches and sheer incompetence. For example, are you familiar with the Guru meditation? This was the Amiga's equivalent to the blue screen of death, or if you're a Mac user, the pinwheel of doom. All he had to do was right click the mouse. They were the hot shots on campus. Probably the scariest. Notices and advertisements were a big part of some editions of the preview guide. Having said that, I'd imagine a few English teachers just cried over this one. Also, if you don't like being preached to, I wouldn't recommend watching the preview guide while in the Bible Belt. He was delicious. <laughs> And that brings us to the end of another episode of the Oddity Archive. Join us next time when we discuss just whatever became of the TV stations that used to air the static.
WVLI bumper stickers at Creative Cabinets in Cinema Riches in Center Reach and Eddie D's hair stylist on Middle Country Road in Center Reach.